Hello, everyone, and welcome to Petite to Queen's Claim Your Career Crown podcast. I'm your host, Lynn, and today I'm joined by our VP of Operations, Amanda, and our wonderful guest, Kelly Thompson. Today, we're going to be talking about how to manage gender expectations as a female leader when your anagram type's gifts don't align with gender norms. So I want to tell you a little bit about our wonderful guest, Kelly. Kelly Thompson is a keynote speaker, writer, and leadership coach. She has delivered talks, webinars, and workshops for many organizations, including the Young Professional Summit, Executive Women International, Medical Solutions, Management Women Inc., and more. She has over 10 years of leadership experience for financial services and technology organizations, and she is certified in reality-based leadership, Myers-Briggs Type Indicator, and the Enneagram. Kelly is actively writing her first book, Closing the Confidence Gap. And I cannot wait. This is going to be released in the new year, 2022. So Kelly, thank you so much for joining us today. Oh, thank you so much for having me. I cannot wait to talk about this topic. Well, this is going to be fabulous. And for anyone who's joining us for the first time, take a moment and click subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. And while you're there, why don't you go ahead and click all five stars for that review? We would very, very much appreciate it. Okay, so Kelly, let's get right to it. We'd love to learn more about you and how you became a leadership coach and what drew you to using anagrams in your coaching. All right, so let's start at the beginning. I know you talk a lot about sales on this podcast and guess where I started. I started as a salesperson and my very first corporate job, I know hearts if you could see the video. Um, my very first job actually was, you know, working in retail, working in a clothing store. I was a bank teller, but my first real out of college job was I was making 50 to 80 phone calls a day selling credit card processing to companies who didn't yet accept credit cards. You know, this was in the early 2000s. And let me tell you, it was very unglamorous. Um, but I did love it. But I'll tell you, the thing that I loved about it the most was when they sat new hires with me. I was like, well, you know, selling was, oh, it was okay. It was a really hard job to call and smile and dial and get rejected. But I loved it when they would put the new hires with me and I would get to help them and train them. And so then I actually moved into sales training. And that's when I got the bug for just, you know, employee and personnel development. And so then I went from sales training to human resources training and employee development training. I managed training teams. I worked as a human resources professional. I even worked in marketing for a little bit, which spoiler alert is just this people psychology, you know, and I had never met a personality test I didn't like. So of course I did the disc, I did the Myers-Briggs, I've done the strength finder. Um, but I didn't come across the Enneagram until I was in entrepreneurship. And so what had happened was as I had worked my way up the corporate ladder, I was leading HR and training teams. I actually worked for an author in a leadership consulting company um, and was traveling a lot. But I started to do more one-to-one -one coaching and I loved it. And I decided I needed to get off the road. And if I was ever going to take the leap into entrepreneurship, now was the time. So I took a leap into entrepreneurship. And that's when I started my you know, leadership coaching and speaking practice. And I was using the Myers-Briggs with my one-on-ones clients. But I started to hear people talk about the Enneagram. And I'm like, what is this? And I'm like, I, I don't know if this is viable. I don't know if this is woo-woo. I don't know what this is. But I started to research it. And... I, I, I thought I found my type and I, I'll, I'll reveal my type at the end because maybe I want the listeners to guess and it'll show you just how hard it is sometimes to find your type. So I thought I was one type, but then as I was doing more personal development work on that, I actually realized through the course of my certification that I was a different type. And this was very eye-opening to me. And it was all of a sudden in a period of about an hour of discovering what my type was. I was like, oh my gosh, my whole life has made sense. This is why I do the things that I do. This is why I avoid the things that I avoid. This is what gives me energy. This is what motivates me. And it was just, it opened up a whole new world for me in terms of you know, overcoming my bad habits, 
really moving into my best self, unlocking a whole nother level in my business. Um, and then that's just how I started using it with clients. And so now I use the Enneagram still personally, absolutely. It's always part of my development plan, but every new client that comes into my private coaching practice takes an Enneagram and I do team Enneagram sessions as well, which unlocks a whole new, um, path for teams to, to, um, bring more emotional intelligence and build relationships in their groups. So yeah. that's how we're here. Yeah, I love your background. I'm sure Lynn is really excited that you started in sales because she's very passionate about that. Yeah. And um, I, I'm like you, I also really love personality tests. I'm an INFJ from the Myers-Briggs and I always find it fascinating. But for me, the Enneagram is kind of something newer to me. I'm not really familiar with it. So for anyone else who's listening who's not familiar with it, can you explain what an Enneagram is? Yeah, Absolutely. for me. <laughs> for me. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Myers Briggs. I am an INTJ, so we, we're we're close. And yeah. so the Enneagram is. I'm just going to go very basic because this sounds like a funny word. Like Enneagram, what is this? Enneagram is a Greek word. Ennea means nine. Gram means something written down or drawn. So it literally is a nine pointed diagram. And so if you've ever seen the Enneagram symbol, it looks maybe a little scary or, you know, people are like, wait, is that diagram? But really is just a circle with nine points. And I'm actually holding up a picture of the diagram for anybody who can see the video. Um, but that's just what it means is a nine pointed diagram. That's what Enneagram stands for. It basically says that there are nine different personality types. That's kind of the 101 level. Now, if you get into the Enneagram, you'll learn that there's actually 27, but for simplicity's sake, it basically says there are nine different types. It's a personality framework that helps us understand how we view the world. It helps us understand our core desires. It helps us understand our motivations. It really shows us how our ego is showing up in a unique way that is filtering our worldview that's holding us back. But the powerful thing about the Enneagram is that it also tells us our path for growth. So for those of you who might know your strengths finder um, themes that might know your Myers-Briggs, that might know your DISC assessment or, or anything else, um, your predictive index, you know, it kind of tells you what you do. It's like, hey, um, you're this type, you know, you're an introvert or an intuitive or a thinker or a judger or whatever that is, but it doesn't necessarily tell you why you are that. So the, and, you know, and sometimes people say, well, these, these personality tests, they just put me in a box, you know, and it tells you what you are, but it's like, Hey, good luck. You're an INFJ, you're an INTA, INTJ, good luck. The Enneagram is a little bit different. It kind of tells you what box you've been putting yourself in maybe unconsciously, but it tells you how to get out of that box. And so in its essence, the, per, the Enneagram is a personality framework that even though it feels new, because a lot of people are talking about it on social media or Instagrams where you see a lot of memes go around, it's actually pretty ancient in its roots. And so it has um, roots all the way back to when Homer was writing the Odyssey, but it also is highly validated both in neuroscience and psychology. So that's what the Enneagram is. And if it would be helpful, I can walk through all the nine types. Where would you guys like to go next? <laughs> well, I'm not sure we have time to go through all nine types, but I think for our audience, they might be interested in from you, from an expert, how do they find their Enneagram type? And you just alluded, it is possible to change it, I assume with personal and professional or growth mindset work. Absolutely. So I'm going to do a breeze through of the nine types in just okay. a few words. So you can find your type a few ways. You can take a test. Tests, free tests are about 50% accurate. So maybe take your, take your first top three results and then read about them. Some people type themselves because they read about it in a book. They're, they read type three and they, they're like, this is it. This is me. This explains my whole life. And you know what? Some people, you know, do it through listening to like to panel interviews. So just really quick, I'm going to breeze through the nine types because this will make the gender expectations a lot, make a lot more sense. Type ones are motivated to be good, to have integrity, to be right and perfect and avoid mistakes. Type twos are motivated by the need to feel loved, needed, and appreciated. Type threes are motivated by the need to feel valuable and worthwhile to succeed and be the best at what they do. 
type fours are motivated by the need to find themselves and their significance and to express their individuality. Type fives are motivated by the need to be capable and competent, be independent and not rely on others for resources. Type sixes are motivated by the need to have security, support and reassurance. Type sevens are motivated by the need to have their needs fulfilled to avoid pain and experience all the possibilities that life has. Type eights are motivated by the need to protect themselves, to be in control of their own life and destiny, and to stay in control, to avoid vulnerability. Type nines are motivated by the need to have inner stability, peace of mind, create harmony, and avoid conflict. This is very important because the, en the Enneagram is all about motivation, not behavior. And so by going through all of the nine types, um, you know, just listen to it, you might think, that's me. That's, that's my unconscious driver of everything that I think, feel, say, and do. That's really interesting. Yeah. yeah. I, I took a quiz yesterday uh, before getting ready for this podcast, and it said I'm a type three. So yeah. it's an online quiz. I don't know if it's completely accurate, but it, I, it at least partially rang true for me. Oh, good. Yeah. I um, think I'm a, all over the map. <laughs> There's only a few that didn't speak to me, but go ahead, Amanda. Yeah. Um, are there better Enneagram types than others for the workplace or for certain roles? You know, so many people ask me that. What type is the best type of leader? Um, you have a lot of salespeople listening. What is the best type of salesperson? There is no one right best type. Now, I'm going to say that, and then I'm going to tell you some things. The United States corporate culture is a type three culture. I'm going to reread this. Remember, type threes are motivated by the need to feel valuable and worthwhile to succeed and be the best at what they do. Wall Street's rewarded. Success is rewarded. Be the best, right? Sometimes in big companies, that's the message that re that's rewarded. So sometimes uh, people think that you need to be a type three to be a good leader. Now, that's absolutely not the case. Every type can make a great leader when they've done their own inner work and they can own their own unique leadership gifts. What I say in my coaching practice is there are nine types of unique leadership gifts. And when you can own those unique, get le unique leadership gifts that are part of your type, anybody can be a great leader. That being said, you might tend to see threes cluster in leadership because that's like a magnet for which they're drawn. Same thing with type eights, just because of the nature that they're create, you know, that they're wired up, you might see them in leadership. Some people think, well, all fours are artists. Well, you know what, even though fours love to be creative, not all fours are artists. You see type fours in corporate America, in leadership positions. And yeah, you even see them as salespeople too. So no, there's no one right way. It's learning what your unique gifts are and using those best in the workplace. Yeah, that's really great. And I think, um, I think it's about like maybe understanding what your personality is and what kind of motivations you have and then working with that. And um, by understanding yourself, you can be a better leader. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah, I couldn't say it better. Thank you. Uh, let's pivot to gender expectations. What do you see as the gender expectations for women leaders? You know, I think culturally what we've been taught as women is that we should exhibit qualities that might ring true for twos or nines. And so again, I'll just kind of, you know, repeat these. Enneagram twos are motivated by the need to feel loved, needed, and appreciated. So sometimes you see that come out behavior-wise in Enneagram twos, and that they can be selfless, they can be giving, they can be helpers, they're great supporters. Enneagram nines, they're motivated to create harmony and avoid conflict. So sometimes gender norms, women have been told to, hey, you know what, let's just uh, be seen and not heard here. Let's minimize <laughs> conflict, create harmony, pull the group together. And so sometimes those have been the historical norms of women, but there's a double-edged sword here yeah. because even though that tends to be what might be expected of women, you also, women also who are two and nines in the workplace say, yeah, but I show up that way. And then they tell me, don't be so sensitive. Don't let your emotions show up at work. And so they have a double-edged sword there. There are a couple types though, that I do think um, struggle sometimes with gender norms in the workplace. And that is Enneagram fives, eights, and sometimes ones. And let me kind of explain that. So remember fives are motivated by the need to be capable and competent, to be independent. 
Um, sometimes those behaviors can show up as an Enneagram five as being somebody who um, likes to work by themselves, likes to be an individual. Sometimes they develop deep expertise in one topic and because of the need to withhold resources, sometimes they can be a little bit direct. They can be a little bit unemotional. They can be a little bit technical in their delivery. And so if you are a woman, you know, and you come across very direct, unemotional, that's not always what's expected. And so people can assume, gosh, this person's really assertive or direct or cold when they're not that way at all. But sometimes that's just how they come off, but it's just not expected as a gender norm. The same thing with eights, you know, um, eights are motivated by the need to avoid vulnerability. And sometimes they can come across as very assertive. And as a man who is an eight leader, that is just rewarded in the workplace, right? Be assertive, be bold, take action. I'm even thinking of salespeople, right? Like go for it, show up, take all the space. But as a woman who shows up, bold, assertive, taking up space, she's called witchy. She's called aggressive. She's called bossy of controlling. And so I think women just really kind of struggle sometimes with, you know, managing these gender expectations because they're just showing up as who they're created to be, but it just doesn't always fit sometimes nicely into those little buckets of norms that, that people ascribe to men versus women. But I think it's time to change that, of course. So. <laughs> yeah. so I think one of the things that's really interesting about that is when you're really truly comfortable in your own shoes or who you are, um, and then of course, willing to stretch and move beyond your comfort zone um, so that you can sort of cross over into all these different anagrams. Uh, you can be a much more powerful leader. Mm -hmm. And so I, I wanna talk about that managing those gender expectations as a woman, because I, I truly believe that women walk a very fine line, uh, double-edged swords as leaders. Mm -hmm. And um, I, I'm, I'm gonna do my thing, sales is leadership. When you, every skill that you learn in sales, you're learning to be a leader because you have to negotiate, you have to have the difficult conversations, mm -hmm. right? You have to sell, you have to convince your boss, your board, whomever, uh, to pursue an idea or to, you know, the path for a project, whatever it happens to be. I mean, heck, we're negotiating what we're gonna watch on Netflix with our partners. Mm -hmm. So, um, so when these expectations don't align stereotypically with female qualities, to your point, being quiet, being polite, and sitting in the back seat. Um, what are some of the things that, how you can manage around that or um, you know, be more effective as a female leader? Sure, I'll use myself as, as an example. So if y'all have been trying to guess my type based on my career or what I do, or even my tone of voice, um, many people would guess that I'm a three. Sometimes people guess I'm an eight, but I am actually an Enneagram five which surprises people because the stereotype of a five is like a curmudgeon professor, a technical expert who doesn't like to talk to anyone. Stereotypes. However, I was a very successful salesperson who was often at the top of sales list. I'm an entrepreneur and you said it best, Lynn, we are all in sales, no matter what. <laughs> and so, you know, some of the gender stereotypes that I've had to overcome in my own career is some of the things that are very typical of fives. My whole life, I've been called direct. Um, my whole life, I've been called unemotional or um, people say that maybe I've lacked empathy. Um, my whole life, people have said, you know, what? that's not really a topic that we want to discuss here. Why are you bringing up things that are just untouchable? You know, like, shouldn't you over there be quiet? There was a five, things were just so obvious to me. And I'm like, why are you doing that? Like I would call yeah. out secret cows and they'd be like, oh, and so I think, you know, um, one of the things that I had to learn how to do was this it wasn't even so much being a woman, but was how do I blend my unique leadership approach, which I will never change because my directness is my superpower. Um, but how do I blend that with my value system? So my core values are love, respect, family, creativity, and learning. I've defined those as my core values. And one of the things I had to learn early on in my career is I don't want to show up and be who I'm not. I've tried that and it doesn't work. I just look <laughs> awkward. But what I can do is I can say, well, how can I, you know, maybe direct isn't what's wrong with me, but if directness is my superpower, 
I can answer this question differently and reframe it. I can say, well, because I'm direct, it gives me the power to cut through the noise and ask for the sale. Because I am direct, it gives me the power to cut through the noise and say in this room what everyone else is thinking, but they're just too scared to ask. You know, there's lots of superpowers, but how can I do that in a way that aligns with my values? So if my values are love, respect, family, creativity, and learning, it's, well, how can I be direct and loving? How can I be direct and respectful? How can I be direct and creative? How can I be a little bit creative about how I'm being direct based on who I'm talking to? The same thing with eights, you know, eights are very assertive. They're bold. What comes into their head comes out of their mouth. They just don't <laughs> think of it. It's just like the anger comes up and they just say it. And you know, what I tell my women that I coach who are Enneagram eights is the exact same thing. That's the advice I would give to any woman leader is how can you use your unique gifts in alignment with your values? So if you are bold and assertive and take up space, how do you do that while also showing up in alignment with your values, which can sometimes allow you to use that unique gift while also considering your audience, considering your approach or your goals or who you're talking to. Yeah, absolutely. And without apologizing either, but instead, um, you know, leaning in to that point, I, I definitely like that, that you can say, you know, this is something that I feel needs to be said. I just did that on a call I was on that, you know, if people aren't showing up, then they need to get off the bus, mm -hmm. you know? And I mean, it was like, but you can preface it in a way, like, I'm not apologizing for saying this, but this is something that needs to be said and mm -hmm. I'm going to say it, you know? Absolutely. And so it, that takes a little bit of the sting out. Um, and that you don't get the thing in, in the, you know, the, the giant B word attached to your name instead People are respecting you for um, being brave and bold to get to the point and to 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 call out the elephant in the room as your point. So I Absolutely. love this. So yes. Yeah, so, so Kelly, thank you so much for sharing because this was something I did not know anything about Enneagram types, and I feel like I've got a whole bunch of new information. I love this, um, and I know that our audience. Um, is going to want to know more because you know how to best use uh, your Enneagram type as a woman leader in the workplace or uh, whatever your gender association is. So mm -hmm. will you share how our listeners can find out more about you and connect Absolutely. with you? Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, one final comment. I also okay. want folks to know is that when I work with organizations, I teach organizations to expand their definition of executive presidents. So I want you know, folks to leave today, it's not always about adapting yourself to what your organization needs. It's if you are a leader of an organization, I want you to expand your definition of executive presence and what gender norms you've unconsciously assigned to each number. Okay, so with that, where can you find me? You can find me on my website at www.kellyraythompson.com. My favorite place to hang out is LinkedIn. And so I'm Kelly Thompson on LinkedIn, but I think believe it's backslash um, Kelly Ray Thompson. I'm Kelly with an I, R-A-E. And so I love to hang out there. I also love to hang out on Instagram. And so you can find out more about me. You can send me a message. If you want to geek out behind the scenes on all things Enneagram, connect with me and I I'd love to chat. All right. That's wonderful. Thank you so much. All those backlinks are in the post below so that you can easily click away. Um, and this has been such an informative discussion. And for everyone who tuned in, um, if you have ideas that you'd like to share, um, please go ahead and use that comment section and leave us a note. Um, we love hearing from you. And of course, if you have a question or would like to suggest a topic for discussion, you can email us at join the conversation at petite and to stay current on all of our insightful advice, the breakthrough advantages, these amazing episodes like we just had with Kelly, sign up for our weekly wisdoms newsletter at petite I want to thank everyone who tuned in and joined us and Amanda and Kelly, thank you so much for joining today. Oh, thank you for having me.